When did you fall in love with GPS? I fell in love with GPS as a Coast Guard helicopter pilot in the mid-1980s. Uh, I went from not having GPS and wondering all the time where I was in the search pattern and when I was going to run out of fuel and where my next fuel cache was to actually being able to look in the water to find people, to pick, pluck them out and take them home. So I know personally of hundreds of folks that likely would not be around today but for GPS, and I know that personally, and I know that each one of you have similar stories. And over the last 50 years since GPS has been approved, it's been such a benefit to America and humanity that it's incredible, it's almost inconceivable, the amount of benefit it's returned. So it's really a great privilege for our nonprofit, the Resilient Navigation Timing Foundation, to be able to host this event and help celebrate GPS. It's a, it's a great occasion, and I hope that everybody has your own souvenir program and are testing your trivia knowledge by looking through it and answering the trivia questions. I hope you also have your Protect, Toughen, and Augment notebook to take home and write in whatever you want, but I hope it's about GPS and P&T. Uh, and uh, your copy of GPS World magazine uh, that has multiple articles about GPS history the, and the way forward. So it's again, it's a great uh, it's a great opportunity for us to do this, and a great opportunity for all of us as a PNT community to gather. And since we were last got together, I have to mention that we have had a little bit of sadness in the. Uh, RNT Foundation, our co-founder and chairman of the board, Marty Fega, passed away. It was not unexpected, but still, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit sad. He had a very, very full life, full of achievements, and we will memorialize him a little bit tomorrow at the PNT Advisory Board meeting. And I encourage those of you that haven't, didn't know him to check out the, 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 our, our blog on, on Marty and all of the great things he did for the United States within the PNT community and, and without. Uh, fortunately, we're very lucky that the Honorable Greg Winfrey has agreed to step up and be our uh, chairman of the board. And we have recently employed him, as you probably noticed, uh, with passing out drink tickets. And also, we are privileged to begin a rapprochement between Greg's institution, the uh, Texas uh, A&M uh, University, and the University of Texas, which we just did tonight. This is probably the most historic occasion you're going to see in your lifetime. So, uh, so there you go. Let me let me give it over to Greg for just a few few remarks before I thank all of our sponsors. Well, thank you so much, Dana. It's a tremendous honor to be in this role, uh, particularly with the passing of Marty Fager. Uh, Marty was the kind of gentleman who always made you feel included. So as dumb as I was with respect to GPS and PNT, he never let me know I asked a dumb question. He always got me educated, and I wouldn't be standing here without him and many of the others. Uh, in this room, dating all the way back to my days uh, as a Fed. So I wanted to say that uh, up front. Uh, but uh, Dana raised the question, when did you fall in love with GPS? I fell in love with it in the early 90s. I am a longtime saltwater fly fisherman. And I do a lot of my fishing up on Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard. And the reason that came to mind is the species on this wall behind me are false albacore, also known as little tunny. So that is a principal uh, uh, sport species that I fish for, but they are very elusive, and you have to know the dynamics of the fishing area to be able to have repeat success, and that's what GPS has done for me, being able to mark those locations during the fall migration. So there's so many usages, uh, beneficial, meritorious, and recreational uh, for GPS, as well as helping me get from point A to point B safely on my motorcycle. Uh, I will say, please don't tell my chancellor, uh, Hook'em Horns, good to see you all here. Uh, Gig'em, and uh, looking forward to continuing to work with you all in this role uh, with the Resilient Navigation Timing Foundation and also, of course, importantly, uh, with the PNT Advisory Board. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dana. And one of my most important uh, 
functions of the evening is to thank our sponsors. I know you're all really bright people and you've seen the posters out front, you've seen the posters behind me, and you're looking through your program to see the sponsors in there. And we are eating and drinking courtesy of their generosity and interest in not only supporting and celebrating PNT and GPS, but also being tomorrow's uh, adventurers and pioneers of new aspects of GPS and PNT. So while we have some history in the uh, program about uh, GPS, we're also looking forward. And these companies and other uh, R&T Foundation members are, are trying to do the look forward and, and continually improving. So as, uh, as you have the opportunity, and as I call your name, if there are representatives of our sponsors today, please hold your hand, everyone, and everyone else. Look for people who are holding up their hands and seek them out this evening and thank them for their generosity and their help putting on this, found, this event. So uh, we have quite a, a big group today. It's Safran, Ursanav, Lokata, ION, the Institute of Navigation, the Royal Institute of Navigation, National Association of Broadcasters, Keysight, Spirant, Helen Systems, Hexagon, that's Hexagon Novotel Antcom, they have a really long name, Microchip, Continental Electronics, and GPS World. So please join me in a round of applause thanking them for their support. So these, this is one of several celebrations of GPS's uh, 50th birthday. And we have a cake up here, by the way, so don't go, uh, go away. I will ask you gentlemen to cut the cake ceremonially before you uh, depart the stage. Um, uh, this is one of several celebrations inspired by the PNT Advisory Board's uh, desire to uh, recognize GPS's 50th anniversary, 50th birthday, as a way of doing a couple things. Uh, in the white paper that the advisory board published, we hoped it, that recognizing this anniversary would spark a White House summit, and that that White House summit would uh, generate a result in raising the awareness of GPS's contributions and importance to America and the world. And to a certain degree, we've been successful in that. We've had several, uh, well, quite a few articles and different outlets. We've had several events like this. And, and generally, I think we're being successful. A couple other things still to be done, though, are leading to improvements in the agility of PT governance by assigning a senior single responsible federal official and lead to implementation of a systems approach to resilient national PT architecture to underpin national security and economic prosperity. The whole paper, white paper is on the website in case you're interested. So, so good to reflect upon the past and uh, all the great things that GPS has done at the same time, also good to look forward and to think about how we can maintain this 50 year legacy going forward into the future. And so with that, I will give you to Mr. Uh, Matteo Lucio, the editor-in-chief of GPS World Magazine, and our own Brad Parkinson, the father of GPS, for uh, a wonderful and interesting discussion that I'm looking forward to as already. So there you go, sir. Good evening. I was thinking that uh, obviously Brad does not need any introduction to this group. I, I, I thought that introducing Brad to this group would be kind of like introducing William Shatner or Patrick Stewart to a Star Trek convention. <laughs> um, so we can dispense with that. Um, and uh, yes, I, I do hope uh, that you picked up a copy of the December issue of GPS World in the back of the room or do so before you leave. Uh, we have articles in there on the history of GPS by uh, Gaylord Green, Marty Faga, uh, Dave uh, Tsilkowski, and Charlie Trimble that I think uh, you'll appreciate. Um, so without any further ado, let me jump into some questions here for Brad. So first, what inspired your original interest in uh, navigation and engineering? Uh, well, this, uh, this conversation really shouldn't be about me, but um, yeah, from an early age, I was interested in maps. I was an Eagle Scout. I was the hike master. I uh, went to MIT and studied under Doc Draper, inertial navigation. Got my uh, master's degree there. I studied at the Air Force. Uh, I, I was head of the Department of Astro and Computer Science at the 
Air Academy, where I taught uh, fundamental astrodynamics. I happen to love that subject. Those of you who are professors know the joy of teaching that particular uh, thing. I was head of uh, inertial navigation testing for the Air Force, so I, I guess I had a lot of background, but more than anything else, I was a practicing navigator because of two years of instruction at the Naval Academy, and I'm the type that even when I'm on a charter sailboat and I have GPS, my family is all amazed because I wouldn't trust GPS. <laughs> Instead, I've got to see a landmark, I've got to look at the depth indicator and be certain that we're not about to run aground because I know ultimately, no matter what the excuse is, if you're the skipper, you got the con, you're responsible. So uh, it goes way back. Well, thanks, Brad. And by the way, I also have a master's from MIT uh, from a few years later, I guess. Um, what were the key differences between the Navy's and the Air Force's proposals for satellite navigation? Now we're getting to the meat of this. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, it, it turns out there was a, uh, I would say, a death struggle going on between NRL and the Air Force, uh, particularly the Air Force at Space and Missile Systems Organization, a program called 621B, and, and via a very funny route, I, w I was suddenly thrust into the leadership position, inherited a design. But the differences were, if you look at the patent, and since then the NRL has tried to uh, change what they were asking, but if you look at the NRL patent, which was issued, I think, in 74, it describes a two-dimensional system. It uses a atomic clock at the user station, and it was using a ranging signal that was side tone ranging, an analog, not a digital signal, which would have required different frequencies or something. They never described how to do that. They made no mention of three dimensions, no mention of resolving time. And the Air Force had had a predecessor study, uh, Woodford and Nakamura. Uh, under the 621B guys, it was very much uh, encouraged on the Air Force by a gentleman named Ivan Getting, who had been the CEO of Aerospace Corporation and the great visionary. Um, I call him the soothsayer. And he had uh, suggested that these engineers look at all the ways to navigate from space. And they came up with a rather long list, including two-way ranging, uh, passive single ranging, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The point is they discovered a technique uh, that required four satellites. It's kind of akin to a Loran in the sky in a certain sense. And with four satellites, uh, a user who is ranging to them simultaneously is able to solve for three dimensions of position, one of time, four uh, quantities that resolve position in four dimensions. And that was the Air Force's uh, advocacy. So we were advocating CDMA, we were advocating four satellites, and we were advocating a system that did not require an atomic clock in the user equipment. We also were suggesting that the initial phase was simply a demonstration with clocks on the ground going up to the satellite, much as the FAA's uh, WAS right now is used for ranging, i.e. the timing was essentially on the ground. Uh, the, the resolution of those, uh, when we held the great Lonely Halls meeting, was we were using the Air Force's concept, the Air Force's signal. We went directly, or attempted to go directly, to atomic clocks in space, both the Air Force and the Navy. The Navy keeps insisting the Air Force didn't want that. If you read the study, it's all over. It's on about four pages in which it says you really need atomic clocks in space. The trouble is no one had flown an atomic clock in space. And uh, as a result of all the risk elements we had, that was probably the riskiest. And I had asked NRL to provide that clock, an atomic, hardened atomic clock for us. The irony was I was nervous, and I asked the Rockwell contractor to provide a backup, and it turned out that the backup was the only operating clock in the first three satellites, and had we not had that, the program would have slipped. The Air Force, ready to pounce and kill me at any time, 
would probably have done that. And so uh, the salvation in this case was the backup clock. But the, the fundamental elements then were an atomic clock in space, four satellites to navigate, user did not require uh, an atomic clock, and the, the fact that with uh, that sort of an arrangement, you were able to navigate in three dimensions using the CDMA signal. <clears throat> and when I presented the CDMA signal in the Pentagon, it was met with enormous skepticism. The reason is they all knew that the signal itself was way below noise level, and the question was, how on earth are you going to be navigating with a signal you can't even see? And of course, that's the power of processing gain. Everyone in this, in this room now nods sagely, oh yeah, we all know about that. But it, it turned out in those days in the Pentagon that was not known. And the other thing that we did, 621B, was to put together a demonstration of uh, that capability in the deserts of California, White Sands Missile Range, in which we had four transmitters. It took us months to, to reduce the data, but it proved you could do 10 meters. And it turned out that was a very critical piece in persuading those who were skeptical about this whole idea of CDMA and navigating with four, four satellites and, and what you could do. Long answer, sorry. That's, that's quite all right. Um, what role did Naval Surface Weapons Center Dahlgren Division and Gladys West have in GPS's early development? Um, first of all, let me say, I, I, I'm very sorry to say I did not know Gladys. I, I knew many of the people at the Naval Surface Weapons Center, but among other things, because of their background in transit and in the ballistics and those calculations that were run with large projectiles, that was where they started, Naval Surface Weapons Center, uh, learned how to shoot 16-inch guns and things. They were the experts in determining what the real figure of the Earth was in terms of gravity. The gravity field of the Earth, a simple one is a point <clears throat> mass, simply a little bit less simple as an oblate spheroid, but then you get down to the really complicated part, which is the spherical and tessaral harmonic expansion of the field of the Earth. And it's my uh, Naval Surface Weapons Center in particular had already worked that problem, not as much as we needed it, but they had done all the groundwork for transit. What we needed was an almost real-time uh, result, and we did some very clever things with Coleman filtering and real-time Coleman filtering. It's my understanding that Gladys West was one of those people who contributed to the understanding and refinement of the gravity field of the Earth. Why do you need it? Because if you don't want to have continuous contact with the satellite as it goes around, you have to determine and predict in advance not only the behavior of the clock, the clock drift, but also what the effect of the lump mass model of the Earth is. And it's astonishing, after 90,000 miles of travel, we can now predict that within a few meters of ranging accuracy. 90,000 miles and a few meters. Uh, to me, that's astonishing, and I think she was one of the contributors to the underlying knowledge that led to that. How does GPS today differ from the design that came out of the Lonely Halls meeting 50 years ago this past September? Well, I'm very proud of what happened because, to my knowledge, there is no fundamental difference. That basically that fundamental design has held up. Today, we would go perhaps to longer codes, particularly for acquisition. Uh, we would probably go to a larger family. We so artificially selected that family. There, there are more, everyone knows what a gold code is. Uh, there are more members of the family. We selected, I think, 32 of them. Uh, we only allowed a bit structure that would accommodate, I think, 32 at the time, and now they could have squeezed it to 64. Um, candidly, it would be a lot better if we had 500 versions of it, and there's no reason we couldn't have done that, particularly if you've gone to something longer than 1,023 bits as the acquisition because as you open up the length, obviously you open up the number of orthogonal codes you can find. So uh, perhaps a long answer, uh, but I don't know of any fundamental way 
that GPS of yesteryear, as a matter of fact, I still have one of the old Trimble handhelds, I think it was called an Ensign, it was a, it was one of those little devices that got shipped to, uh, to uh, the yeah. Iraq war. And uh, it, uh, I, uh, the other day I pulled it out, the batteries were kind of crummy, I got those squared away and went out and sure enough it navigated. And I, I probably hadn't pulled it out in at least 20 years. And uh, the point of the story is evidently it still works. I'm talking about the whole system now. Okay. In your presentation at the sixth annual precise time and time interval planning meeting uh -oh. in, in December 1974, you predicted the GPS would achieve initial operational capa capability oh. in about 1984. What delayed IOC to 1993? Well, uh, there's one crisp answer, and that's money. Because we, uh, we were prepared to go into mass production on those satellites. There was no reason we couldn't have. But uh, at the time, the Air Force, first of all, tried, after we got through all of our test results, showed how beautiful it worked, met every promise, the Air Force still tried to cancel the program. And they tried that for at least two years in a row. Had they instead gone throttle to the wall, I think we could have achieved, if not 1984, certainly by 1986. But the result was pulling way back on the whole process. Uh, the Navy, uh, excuse me, the Air Force, of course, has now totally embraced GPS, perhaps to the point of pain as you hear them talk about it. But at that time, the Air Force would much rather buy airplanes, and it was a reflection of perhaps a Kurt LeMay barrage bombing. I don't think I had a, I had had experience with precise, precision weapon delivery uh, over Laos. Many fun evenings getting shot at. I understood what the payoff was of 10 meter accuracy, and I certainly not only intellectually but emotionally felt that precision weapon delivery was the right answer. Hit the target, don't hit a hospital or a church or something like that. But I don't think the Air Force had embraced that view yet. And the reason uh, that the result was a uh, turning down of the total budget that was available. And the consequence was stretching out that development. But there were some other things that happened. To get approval, as I understand it, they had to make a compromise put the uh, nuclear detection system on board the satellite, which made it more complex and weighty, but on the other hand, allowed it to get through the Air Force's budgeting and programming process. And eventually we got the satellites up there. I think it took 20 or 21 years, actually, rather than perhaps the 15 that it should have. It also, if you think about it, what almost always happens first with these classes of systems is you have to get signals on the ground before the user gets serious about equipping himself. In our case, that was accelerated by the Iraqi war. It actually, uh, the Kosovo thing had also done a, a job on that. But uh, uh, until the operators see that it, there is a real tangible value, they're not going to encourage the funders to buy them lots of user equipment. Fortunately, that has now happened. What's the key thing that some histories of GPS get wrong? Um, well, I, the one thing that I find very irritating is they will keep saying, well, it's a military system and then uh, President Reagan let the civilians use it. That is absolutely not true. I testified before Congress in 75, before we launched the first satellite, that the clear acquisition signal was gonna be available to the civilians, that they would be able to navigate, but we weren't guaranteeing it. But the point is, the civilians, certainly certain visionary companies and research organizations had already started to build the equipment. And when we turned on the very first satellite, I believe that the first civil receipt of that signal was by students at the University of Leeds under Dr. Peter Daly. He had gone to us and requested the spec. His students had went to work, went to work and indeed put together a receiver 
So by the time that signal came around a couple of times, they had locked up on that signal. So the point is, it was available to civilians from the very beginning. It was not guaranteed. Reagan guaranteed it. And at the time, the military was wiggling the signal called selective availability. And of course, uh, later, President Carter's administration and President Carter himself, or excuse me, Clinton, Clinton President Clinton himself uh, ended up uh, saying it's going to be turned off and will never be turned on again. And my belief is it will because everyone in this room who has a background in this subject knows that differential GPS trivially defeats that wiggle. As a matter of fact, it doesn't just defeat the wiggle, it also takes out the natural errors. So in so doing, their selective availability was encouraging the reversal of it. And sure enough, the Coast Guard was already broadcasting all the corrections. So you had the irony of the Air Force putting in the wiggle and another branch of government taking the wiggle back out. And by the way, a little more in addition. Um, I always felt that was amusing. I went to General Meyer, who was head of Air Force Space Command then. Um, me and my mentor, uh, Dr. Schlesinger, went in, just the two of us and the general, and I went through a long presentation on why this was very foolish. And he finally looked at me and he said, well, Brad, I agree with you, but I don't think I have the authority to turn it off. And I guess he didn't. And it wasn't until later that uh, the White House uh, indeed made that decision. I'm certainly glad they did because it was sort of a black mark against GPS in contrast with Galileo. And Galileo had made the argument, well, that's, that dirty GPS is controlled by the military and they're not interested in us. And unfortunately, this was a flag that kind of confirmed that. Did the mission, I'm sorry, did the mission of GPS uh, significantly change uh, over the years? What about the, the guidance or the, the leadership, the budget? Were there any major changes in any of those? Well, I, I, I think the first was a resolve to actually build the system, and that did not exist even by 1978 after we'd done the testing. So in that sense, there was a change. Uh, but in terms of the basic mission of providing precise positioning, navigation, and time to the military, and that is the fundamental purpose, and certainly we now have an auxiliary purpose written into the law that says, by the way, Air Force, you're already also charged with looking after the civilians and looking after their civilian signal. And if you talk to SOPs, that's indeed what they, they would ascribe to. So uh, perhaps in a sense, that mission has changed, but the fundamental mission of PNT has not, to my knowledge. As far as, um, well, I guess, as far as the leadership, the organization, that's, there's been a, a few changes over the years, but nothing fundamental? I don't think so. I, I think that the development and acquisition management has changed rather radically. Uh, I, I, right now, as I see it, the, um, the acquisition force is by and large feels they're charged with stamping out whatever they've been directed to do. And the difference between that and the old sick the old uh, program, joint program office, is that we also felt part of our obligation was pushing changes, pushing the future, pushing new stuff onto it. I don't sense that in the, uh, in the current uh, immediate satellite builders at uh, Los Angeles. I'm not condemning them. That is their guidance. That's what they're charged with doing. But I worry that we don't have a central focus looking ahead to, uh, for example, pushing the retro reflectors. We've had a long argument about that. They've accepted them, but they're still not on there. Uh, pushing L5, getting it actuated as quickly as possible. That is still not operating, and that's certainly a, a major civilian need. Um, I can see laser in, in calm. I can see uh, up uploading more frequently than once every 12 hours. All those to me are improvements that should be made and should be in the in the hopper rather than being studied right now and it's not happening to my knowledge. Um, back then, meaning Lonely Halls and <clears throat> first few years after that, did you envision adding frequencies? Uh, no, uh, we were struggling just to get two. 
Uh, our two were, of course, L1 and L2. And uh, unbeknownst to many of you, perhaps, is that the first phase satellites had the capability of putting a civil signal on L1. There was the ability to command from the ground either L1P on uh, PY on L2 or L1CA, but not both because of power limitations. It was my understanding that sometime after I left the program, the wire that would have controlled doing that was physically cut before the satellite was launched because the military wanted to assure that they always had the dual frequency capability. And I, I, I can't verify that last statement, but I think it's true. And of course, it was not reinstated until much later, but, it, but it's reinstated uh, today. Now, fast forward, I went away from DOD, didn't have anything to do with them for about 15 years, and then I got uh, pulled back in by my classmate, a Major General Rosie Rosenberg. Does anyone know who he is? <laughs> yeah, a, a wonderful character. He's still alive, uh, not doing too well. But uh, the point is, I went on the IRT, and about the first meeting, we had a gathering, and one of the subjects was additional civil signals. And this group was principally DOD oriented, and ha ha ha, the civilians are asking for a third signal, isn't that ridiculous? And my statement was, yes, it is, because what they really need is two more signals. <laughs> and uh, it, you know, we beat that around, but finally you had L1C and L5. And I, I don't take credit for doing that, but I certainly was an advocate for uh, expanding that capability, and I'd like to see L5 come on the line as soon as possible. Well. Beyond the uh, early phases, what were the major milestones over the decades? Obviously, there is the zeroing out of selective availability, which you mentioned, the whole <clears throat> modernization program, M-code. What were the, the key inflection points? Well, I think the biggest key inflection point was a reversal of the Air Force support. When they finally realized what they had, and the, and the Army certainly had it in spades as they had their tanks lost in the desert. Um, I, 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 to me, that was a whole sea change. The second sea change, <laughs> so it's 1975, and um, there is an FAA director of programs, and I, I don't know his name, and I better not say it if I did. But he was asked on a stage, this is before us, GPS had demonstrated its first launch. He was asked from the stage in Washington, well, uh, we've got this GPS coming along. How do you feel about that? He said very simply, we don't need it, we don't want it, and if it ever shows up, we will never use it. And I had some uh, relatively obstreperous captains, majors on my team, and they said, oh, you've got you've to go and, and scream about that. You've got to push back. And I said, no, I don't think so. I, I think what we do is demonstrate what we can do and let nature take its course. And I think to a large extent that's happened, although I think that getting the FAA to fully uh, accept it in the early days is a tribute to certain heroes, certain uh, people at uh, FAA who are pushing this because it was by no means the centroid of what they wanted to do. But it has come along now to the point that I regard FAA as a firm ally in what we're trying to do in terms of modernizing GPS, in terms of using it, particularly for aviation, helicopters, RPVs, and air traffic control. And uh, I, uh, so I think that's about what I wanted to say. How important was it to have a joint program office, uh, JPO? For, for GPS at the outset. What was helpful and not so helpful about that? Uh, we were the first ever joint program office. And I think I can say that with some assurance. When uh, Mel Curry came into that position, uh, one of the things he was trying to do is break down the barriers between the services. And he recognized, I think, that one of the ways to do that was create programs that were not, they were administered by one service, but they weren't exclusively 
a single service um, function or program. So I had deputies from the Army, Navy, Marine Corps. Um, what am I missing here? Army, Navy, Air Force. Oh, and the Defense Mapping Agency, who recognized early on that this was a revolution for them. I did not have a NATO deputy at the beginning. I will say that it was outstanding. And the reason is they were a part of us instead of being on the outside shooting at us. Now, on the other hand, they didn't have a lot of people in my program, but I did have a deputy. And I resolved as soon as I was forced with this structure, I did not allow the deputies to be observers. I insist that it, every one of them take a segment of what we were technically doing and become actively involved as a part of what we were doing. So they were deputies, not simply as representatives of their service. I, I told them they got to report back to their service anything they heard. I didn't care. But the one thing they could not do is just sit on their hands. So uh, I signed one, responsibility in the user equipment area, uh, et cetera, et cetera. One had the, the test, I think the Marine, uh, I asked to help with all the tests set up down at Yuma, which was very extensive and, uh, and so on and so forth. And so the, the joint program construct was very, very valuable for us. And I, I, I think it, it led to a lot of benefits for the taxpayer too. Well, you mentioned that initially JPO did not have a NATO rep but once you had one, um, what was the impact of that? I, I can't answer that. That really happened after my watch. I think it was a year after I left that, that the NATO representative came up aboard, and I think I think we had I, we had at least one NATO gent. Uh, but again, um, when I left the program, I resolved to not go back in any way. I didn't want to interfere. I didn't want to be seen as encouraging contracts or any other relationship with my friends. I think in the total, until I got dragged back into the IRT about 15 years later, um, maybe 20 years later, 18 years later, I think I'd only been back in the program office once, and that was a social trip because Gaylord Green, all of you know Gaylord, and he's worked for me three times, and he's one of my great, great heroes. He's one of the greatest engineers, frankly, that this country has ever produced. And uh, I went back there to talk to him about wine tasting. So that was, that was the deal. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I got Gaylord to write a, a, a short essay in the December issue of GPS World. Um, so you, you might want to pass on the next question for the same reason the, the, uh, of it happening after you, you left JPO. But, uh, were there any significant challenges in getting global acceptance and cooperation for GPS? I, th I think the fundamental answer to that is the same, that if you set it up so that the signals have accuracy, uh, availability, and integrity, and continuity, the, the FAA parameters, if you set it up, you give them that, hopefully pick a signal whose receivers can eventually be inexpensive, nature kind of takes its course, and I take absolutely no credit for that. But fortunately, we were beneficiaries of the great in, uh, integrated circuit revolution. It was just at its infancy, beginning, when we started to, when we were running our test program. We had no, to my knowledge, I don't think we had in, any integrated circuits in there, although we may have. We may have rudimentary computers. But the point is, since then, uh, here in this little device, I've got an integrated chip. In the old days, a man pack weighed 40 pounds, 40 watts with six hour batteries, and it had one channel. In here, I've got over 100 channels. I got it simultaneously uh, able to receive them. And if I get one of the better models, and Frank probably is selling some, where is he? Uh, Dual frequency uh, ability to, I think, actually get down to the carrier tracking level. Uh, my gosh, you get that for three dollars, and it cost me 250 grand for an extra man pack. So not only were you bathing the world with free signals, 
you were also offering, or you do today, offer darn near free receivers. And all then you have to do is figure out what are the wonderful applications for that. And of course, a large number of, of engineers have been able to do that. Well, that's a perfect segue to my next question. Which applications that are now commonplace did you expect from the beginning, and which ones surprised you the most? Well, I, I, I drew a bunch of little diagrams, if you've heard some of my talks uh, back in 78, long before any of this had matured, uh, of some of the things that I could see. I could already see the car navigation. I could certainly see aircraft navigation. I could see a function in air traffic control. i tell you the one that I totally missed. I, I had one of my pictures showed road grading, and um, fair enough. But the real application that I totally missed was farming. We later caught up, of course, at Stanford. We pioneered the uh, John, John Deere, uh, would, uh, allied with John Deere, we pioneered auto farming. Uh, Mike O'Connor, Tom Bell, uh, some of my real heroes, the young students at the time who actually did it. I, I could conceive of what we were going to do, and then as a professor normally does, oh, okay, there's some details, go, go off and work those. And uh, they was, weren't details, those are very hard problems. Uh, I'll tell you, the biggest problem on a farm tractor, and uh, you may not believe this, the biggest problem was the hydraulic controller for the steering mechanism. And if you're a control engineer, I'll tell you why that was such a heck of a problem. Their standard hydraulic device had an enormous dead zone, had enormous hysteresis, and any attempt to wrap a linear controller around that would lead, if you tried to tighten the bandwidth, you were immediately in a big oscillation. And we finally went back to Waterloo in Iowa. We had, by then, Deere initially didn't think they wanted to do any of this, but they quickly got the message. And we went back and say, listen, that 50 buck hydraulic controller, you gotta change that out. We need a $200 controller. And bless their hearts, they did that. Meanwhile, we had, we had kind of inverted. And for those of you that are control engineers, you understand what I'm saying. This is a heck of a problem. As long as I'm doing fairly sloppy steering, I can get away with it. But if I'm trying to steer to a, a few inches with a huge dead zone and the uh, slope of the output on one side is different than the other side, and furthermore, there's hysteresis. So if you're going one way, the gain is one thing, and you're coming back the other way, it's different. This is a nasty, nasty control problem. And fortunately, the way out of it we, we inverted that in a certain sense and were able to demonstrate, but the way out of it was by a good device and, uh, and Deere finally bought into that. What do you consider the most significant impact of GPS on society? This is a, probably the broadest question of the whole interview. Um, well, I. The most significant impact is also the, probably the most perilous. And that impact is that it, the kids of today now take it for granted they know where they are. They just take it for granted. And if you go back to, uh, well, I was talking to one of my colleagues at, at the table just recently. Uh, if you go back to 1927 when the Navy r ran a whole squadron into the rocks off California destroying four within a minute and a half, ended up destroying four virtually brand new, within five-year-old destroyers because of a navigation error. Well, that wouldn't happen today. I hope it wouldn't. But I, I still cross-check. But the point is, navigation and positioning is taken for granted. Now, the downside of that is what GPS does is simply tell you, I don't have to tell everyone in this room this, but uh, what GPS does is simply tell you where you are. You need mapping software and somewhere, something to embed that lat long into coordinates that represent the, the face of the Earth, if, if that's what you're doing. And uh, frankly, I, I always cross-check. I love to read maps. I enjoy reading maps. If you, I suspect, go to most 18, 20-year-old kids, they'd be pretty lost if you handed them a map and say, I want you to go to Stockton. You know, I, I, I so that 
the very strength in terms of being taken for granted also has this downside. It has another downside, which uh, is represented, uh, is, has been addressed by the Supreme Court. And that is the fact that you can locate things very, very well implies that I can track things very, very well, which implies I can track people very, very well without their even knowing it. And fortunately, the Supreme Court said, if you do that for any law enforcement purpose, you have to get a warrant first. You have to have a reason to intrude on their personal privacy. And so th th there's another small downside. It's, it, it's a loophole. I, I think it's being, it has been addressed in our legal system, but uh, I know that there are some things you can go online and say, you know, it says, track your wife you know, or, or whatever, and you can imagine why someone might want to do that. But um, frankly, that was not a purpose I originally thought of. So uh, for the last, uh, we have eight minutes and 25 seconds. I hope not. Um, so uh, let's, let's look at the future. Uh, how might GPS evolve in the next decade? And, and here's where you might also want to address uh, what we call complementary PNT. Uh, I don't call it alternative PNT because I say that, I mean, the only alternative to a GNSS is another GNSS. But uh, but 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 augmentation, Leos, all of all of that. Um, well, it's fashionable now to look at Leos as a, I don't know what, whether you're called alternative supplement or what have you. I I think that's great, but. These, this board, the PNT Advisory Board, has gone on record saying there's no equivalent to GNSS in terms of 24-7 worldwide three-dimensional accuracy. There, there is no equivalent. And um, I, I, the LEOs may approach it, but they don't have a government guarantee. Maybe one of them will soon. But the thing I, looking ahead, the, the number one irritant I have right now is back in 1978, we demonstrated you could make a GPS receiver that could fly directly over a 10 kilowatt jammer and never even see it. Never even see it. And a lot of the agonizing that's going on today is because of assumed interference. The interference is real, no question. But right now, the United States government does not allow our commercial manufacturers to use the antenna technology or, the, I think, the deep integration in which you use inertial components to narrow the uh, tracking, the final tracking loops. And that alone, those, those two things, increases jam resistance by factors of 100,000 or more. So looking ahead, the one thing I hope will happen is that we look at our PTA, look at the T, the toughening, and don't forget it. Having A along, augmentation, that's fine. And we have to P, we have to protect the frequencies in the spectrum. There are some other details, frankly, I would like to see. I would like to see us moving in the direction of laser links between the satellites to allow instant upload and adjustment and some modest messaging, perhaps. I would certainly like to see those retro reflectors on there um, very, very soon. And obviously, I would love to see L5 fully operational. Uh, it's a, a pet peeve that this, which is probably the greatest capability civil signal, has been so, so greatly delayed in terms of full operational capability. And uh, I, I just hope that we will continue to modernize. And that's all on the system side. I think on the other side, there's probably a lot of regulatory issues that are gonna to have to be addressed. For example, my suggestion that we put such directional antennas on an airplane is not simple. Uh, Tim is around here somewhere, I feel like I saw him. And he will right away tell you, well, it's one thing to demonstrate it, even have it manufactured, but it has to be certified by the FAA through an RTCA process. All that takes time, and, and I, I, I'm getting old, so I, I wanna see that happen. And uh, I think it's a race right now. I'm, I'm a little worried. So I'm hoping that we're gonna be able to do something about that, and uh, 
That's it. I, but, but before I end up, though, I have again, oh, you have another question. Last question. I, but, but, you said that last one was the last question. No, I said I, how much time Oh, OK. Um, so today, for many applications, a GNSS receiver is one of several sensors. For example, autonomous vehicles, you know, self-driving cars, also use LIDAR, radar, and cameras, and so forth. So for which applications will GNSS remain the essential source of truth for the foreseeable future? I don't think in any of those applications it is the essential source of truth. I think when you talk the kind of precision that LIDARs are looking at, particularly against transient targets such as other cars, it has an essential role. And I, I, I liken it to uh, the one-legged man. You know, if you got two legs, you like both legs. You don't want just one leg. And when it comes to the integrated solution on robotic cars, vehicles of any kind, it's an integrated system engineering solution. And GPS, I think, has a fundamental role. It has an advantage in that it's virtually free. On the other hand, it has some vulnerabilities that have to be addressed. But when it comes down to positioning on a lane and a highway, uh, we have ways to get pretty close to that, but I'm not certain we've got the integrity. But on the other hand, if I have LIDAR or some form of radar or whatever other techniques we might have, uh, then I have an integrated solution. And the integrity of the total should, if done properly, be one heck of a lot better than simply relying on one or saying, that's it. I don't think we have a that's it. I think it's all of it, uh, frankly. Well, Is that um, really the last question? It, that was the last question. So if we, the, go back to what you're going to say and any okay. final remarks. All right. I, I just wanted to thank Dana again and, our, and the uh, resilient uh, resilient navigation technology no. organization and, and timing and timing uh, for putting this on and uh, I, I must confess I feel like I'm preaching to the choir many of you already probably could have given the talk I just gave and uh, knew two-thirds of it already but nonetheless thanks for your tolerance and uh, it is as always a great joy to come and see so many old friends Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Dana. Thank you all.